right, we're back. Hopefully to a not too manic Monday. So what we're gonna do today is we're going to have a minute to kind of catch up with where we left off on Friday. We'll talk a little bit more about polymorphism. And then I've, you know, allocated some time for us to do a couple problems together. I'll take questions about objects. Um, so it's sort of a catch up day a little bit. Um, the first thing I want to talk about um, is it's a good point of the semester. MP1 is ramping up. We're releasing MP2 today. Um, how many people have been frustrated at some point during this class so far? All right, just be honest. There you go. Right. Um, you know, so I, I wish that I could tell you that that ends. That at some point in your future career as a computer scientist and software developer, you won't be frustrated. Um, except that I was like frustrated yesterday. Um, and pretty much everyone I know in this field is frustrated on a regular basis. So it doesn't end. Um, what helps is to get good at dealing with it. Computers are these frustrating machines. You know, I've been talking with one of my colleagues and you know, she and I have been reminding each other that everybody in computer science who works directly with computers, particularly if you're trying to build things or write computer code, um, you have to acknowledge that you are in a destructive relationship with the computer. It's a negative relationship. The computer's not nice, it's not patient, um, it doesn't, it's not shy about pointing out your flaws. It demands sort of like very, very high level of logical consistency. Um, it's hard on you. Um, and so one of the things to keep in mind is when you're dealing with other people, whether that's the course staff, other students in the class, uh, keep that in mind. You guys are all, you know, might have a fair amount of negativity frustration that's emerging from this relationship that you're starting to develop. Uh, where you're starting to be able to interact more productively with the computer, but it comes along with a fair amount of frustration. Um, when you interact with other people, you can do one of two things, okay? I have an opinion about which one is right. Number one, and this happens too often in computer science, um, I've been guilty of it, I've been the victim of it, is that people take out that frustration on each other, right? So people you know, take out that anger that they feel, that frustration and not being able to get the computer to do what they want on the people around them. Sometimes it takes the form of just venting, sometimes it takes the form of snippiness, whatever it is. Sometimes you start to expect the people around you to behave like computers, which they don't. Um, so that's door one. Door two is you keep in mind that everybody is going through this together, that the people around you are having the same experiences and you use this as an opportunity to build a community and to build better human relationships with those people and to be able to commiserate, to be able to empathize. You know what they're going through. You're going through the same thing. Everybody in this class has been frustrated at some point. So when someone next to you in office hours or in lab or you can see someone on the forum is posting they're frustrated, you know what that was like. A lot of times it happened to you just a few minutes ago. That's my suggestion for you is that you use this as an experience to help build up your capacities for empathy. Uh, and for understanding. And again, the, the people that are drawn into this field are not necessarily always the people that are particularly good at that, okay? But the computer gives you a great training ground. It's a great uh, way to develop this. And trust me, it will help. Does anyone have any specific suggestions about what to do? What, what's something someone do you want to do? Because the other thing you have to do is you have to learn to cope, right? So you have to find ways to deal constructively with your frustration. So someone give me an example. Someone tell me something that they do when they get frustrated. Your program's not working properly, the test cases aren't passing, you can't understand why, you know, you've been working at this for a while, what do you do? Yeah. Take a break. How many people have taken a break before when that happens? Great thing to do. How many people have come back and immediately they see what the problem is? Particularly like if you sleep, you know, take a walk, talk to a friend, do something different, you know, browse the internet for half an hour, whatever. Just let your mind work on it in the background. What else? What else do people do? There's no wrong answer here. All these strategies are fine. Well, there are some wrong answers. But, um, another strategy for when you feel frustrated. What do you do? Yeah. Drink cold water. I like that. That's a good one. 
Yeah, sometimes you're getting a little overheated, helps to cool down. Sometimes I just swear really loudly, you know? Like I'll just scream a bad word. Yeah, in the back. What's that? Say that one more time. Get some Chipotle. There we go. Eat. Yeah. So again, I mean, like, what I'm, what I'm explaining to you, and I, I really do care about you guys, and I want you to succeed in this class. You guys are doing great. MP2 is, is a new challenge, though, right? So I'm saying this at a particular point in the semester for a reason. Um, learning how to take care of yourself in the face of this type of frustration, this type of computer-generated frustration and failure is really important. Whatever it is you do, as long as it doesn't hurt somebody else or harm somebody around you, it's fine, right? Go work out, like pet an animal if you have one, right? Watch funny videos of cats online, it doesn't matter. Right? But do something to allow yourself to settle down, calm down. And this is an important skill to learn because like I said, the frustration does not stop. It just doesn't. You get better at it, you get more productive, you're doing more per unit frustration, but it's not something that you can just grit your teeth and get through. It's not gonna go away after you take 225. It's not gonna go away after you get an internship at Facebook. It's not gonna go away after you transfer into computer science. It's not gonna go away after you, you get all A's throughout your entire, it doesn't go away. All those things don't make it stop, right? The only thing you can do is learn how to cope with it and treat the other people around you well while you do that. Okay, good. So on Friday, not Friday, Wednesday, so last Wednesday we started talking about polymorphism. So polymorphism is this idea that um, the objects that we create um, in Java can behave differently depending on the context. Polymorph, so poly is multiple, morph is change. So the objects we create in Java, all of them can behave in at least two different ways and sometimes in many different ways depending on the context. And the reason for this is that in Java, every object except for one is an instance of at least two types. Remember, the pet class, which I declared starting on line one, does not explicitly extend another class, but that still means that it's a subclass of capital O object. So pet can behave both like a pet instance of pet Instances of pet can behave both like an instance of the pet class and also like an instance of the object class. That's why I can call toString, because toString is defined, in this case, on the capital O object class. Dogs actually explicitly extend another class. So an instance of dog can behave, can morph into a dog, that's what it is, it can also behave like a pet, it can also behave like a capital O object. Um, so as a dog, it has this print me function that will print I'm a dog. It does, at this point, if, if it didn't have that, it would still be able to behave like a pet and it would, print me would work a little bit differently. But in this case, I've overridden print me. And because it can also behave like an object, it has those object methods that we've talked about. To string, hash code, and equals, along with some other ones that aren't as useful to us. So when do objects morph into other types of objects? So when does this actually happen? When do these transformations take place? There's two different types of transformations that we need to distinguish. One I'm gonna to refer to as an upcast. So an upcast takes an instance of an object and has it behave like one of its ancestors. So we just said, a pet can also behave like an object. A dog can also behave like an object. Both pet and dog and every other object in Java can behave like a capital O object. And so that's why this piece of code that we looked at at the very end of class on Wednesday works. So I have this, let me draw your attention down here to line 14 where I have a method called print anything. That method takes an object as an argument, a capital O object, but really, and this is important distinction. When we write a method signature like this, actually what we're telling Java is we're saying, 
My method can be called and accept as an argument anything that can behave like an object. Anything in Java that can morph into a capital O object can be passed as an argument to this print anything method. And as a result, its name is completely appropriate. It can literally print anything because everything in Java can behave like a capital O object. So I can pass anything I want to this method. All it does is it calls toString on the argument, and I know that every object in Java has a toString method. Either they have the toString method provided by capital O object, or they've overridden it somewhere, and they have a more um, customized implementation of toString. But this is why I can call toString, because object provides it. And so every, I can guarantee that anything that can behave like an object, which is every object in Java, can have toString called on it. And again, I'm being a little bit loose here with object and capital O object. I'll try to be more clear about it. Anything that can behave like a capital O object, which is every lowercase object in Java, can be passed to this argument. And so that's why here I can pass, and, and we'll do it in the playground here, I can pass both a dog and a pet into this method, okay? Questions about this before we go on? Okay, now here's what's, there's something else that's interesting about this. Okay, can, it, can anyone spot it? So the first thing we pointed out here about this example that we needed to understand is that I can pass an argument that's a dog on line 11 and an argument that's a pet on line 10, sorry, on line 12. I create my dog on line 9, I create my pet on line 10, I pass the dog to print anything on line 11, I pass the pet to print anything on line 12. So I can pass both of those to this. But what's interesting about what's being printed, somebody... So both dog and pets are behaving like an object, except there's something interesting. Yeah. Uh, what's happening is the dog class overrides the string method. So when you call that method, it will override the string method. Yeah. And then the dog class controls for dog, pets, but not override the string method. Yeah. So so here's the thing, and and this is something that people struggle with, and I admit this is a, this is complicated. Okay. It's a little confusing. Both dog and pet are behaving like an object in this method. But that doesn't mean that I have to use the default toString method provided by object. See that dog, when I print dog, I'm actually running this code, right? So even though inside this function, when I call it on line 11 with the dog argument, my dog is morphing into an object and behaving like an object while it's being used by this method, I still preserve the dog-specific two-string method. So if you think about this, what this means is that Java still knows what kind of object it is, right? So again, and this is going to be more important in a few days when we start talking about object references. What kind of object is something? Look to the right of new. This will always tell you the right answer, okay? This is a dog. The variable choo-choo stores a dog object. Ziz stores a pet object. When I pass those to this print anything method, Java allows them to both behave like objects, but it doesn't forget what kind of object they actually are. Java still knows that choo-choo is a dog object. That's why when I call toString, it starts looking for a toString method in the dog class. And it finds this um, alternate implementation of toString that we've provided. This overrides the default object behavior. When I call it with a pet, pet does not override toString. And so here, I start looking in pet. I don't find a toString method, and I go up to object, and I get this default to string method that we've seen before. Questions about this? This is, again, this is getting to the, sort of the heart of how polymorphism works. Yeah. Um, 
Oh, yeah, okay, so the question is, how do we override toString? All we have to do is we have to define a function on our pet class that has the correct signature. So let's do that. We'll say, I'm a pet. And now you'll see, so this is a great, great question, because it gives us another chance to talk about how this works. Oops, let me pull this down a little bit. So now you'll see, when I call to print, sorry, when I call to string on the dog instance, when it's called on line 15, Java starts looking for a to string method in the dog class, and it finds one right away, because I've defined one with the right signature. It's public, returns a string, takes no arguments. That's what gets called. When I call it on a pet, I start in the pet class. I look for a to string method with the right signature. Takes no arguments, returns a string, it's public, I find it, and I get that result. Great question. Yeah. Great question. Let's find out. So now let's, instead, because I'm lazy, I'm just gonna call, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna name this something that's wrong. Yeah. So now what happened when I called to string on the dog instance, in my first call to print anything, is I started looking on dog. And I was looking for a method called toString, T-O. I didn't find it. So I kept going. I went up to the parent, pet, found it. So the default object method doesn't get called. Yeah. Yeah, let's try this on a different type of object. So somebody is, um, let's create a string. And then let's call that on the string. What do you think is going to be printed when I print to string on a string? I'll make this a little bit. Yeah. So when you call to string, so this is so so when I call to string on a string object, I get the contents of that string. Makes total sense. So string over the string class, we don't have the code for string in front of us, but we know that it overrides to string and it just returns the characters that are stored in that string. Great questions. Another one, yeah. Okay, so the question is, why is, um, so the, the, the question has to do, I think, with how the search works. So the question is, how does Java look for a toString method? So when I call toString, it starts in the class that the object is an instance of. And this is what I was saying before. This is how we know that Java still knows that Choo Choo is a dog. Choo Choo's a dog even though it's morphing into an object for the purposes of this method. Java still remembers what kind of object it actually is, okay? And so it starts looking in dog, it doesn't find the dog, a two-string method, and then it looks up an object. Does that answer your question? Yeah. If I fix this and I make my two-string method, oh, I have to fix it properly. Do the right thing. Now, now it finds it right away. Great questions. Other questions? About this? Yeah. Oh yeah. So great. Uh, so this is a good question. So the question is, why can I use print anything in example if it's written, if it's written below it? So um, this might be something that, that comes in if you've learned, if you know some Python, okay? So when Python evaluates source code, it goes line by line. And so if you try to use a function before it's defined, it's a problem. In Java, the whole program is compiled first and then it's run, right? So I can put this print anything method anywhere inside the class. Yeah, great question. If, if you wrote something similar in Python, it would be an error, right? And that's just because Python is going line by line and actually executing as it goes along. Great question. Yeah. Ah, okay, so the question is, there's a, you, you guys might have seen this before. I don't know if it's gonna work in the playground or not. Let's try it. Oh, it works, sweet. So the question is, what's the point of this? And I, don't, I really don't want to get into a digression about annotations. Uh, we don't cover them in this class. Uh, you might have seen these on the MP, but let me give you like the 30 second answer, okay? What this does, and again, I don't know if it's gonna work in the playground or not, let's find out. 
Oh, it does. Look at that. Wow. I'm impressed with myself. There we go. Um, so what is this particular, so this is something that's called an annotation in Java. It starts with an ampersand, and then there's, there's whole families of these, right? And you can attach these to methods, to classes, to variables. Um, what this particular one does, this is a very common one. Maybe it's the most common one out there. What this does is it, is it tells Java that what I'm trying to do is override a method provided by one of my ancestors. And so what is it helping me with here? Why would I use this annotation? This annotation just found a bug in my code. What bug did it help me find? So let's, let's look at the difference here. If I take this off, just comment it out, okay? If I put it back, now my code doesn't compile. Why not? Someone explain this to me. Yeah. Yeah, there's no, actually, in the object class either. So what I've done is I've said, I'm overriding a method. That's what this annotation means. It declares to Java that what I'm trying to do is override a method. And so when Java sees this annotation, it says, okay, I'm gonna make sure that you're actually overriding a method, right? And in this case, what happened is I have a typo, right? I just fat fingered the name of the function. So now if I, if I have this, this two string, everything works. So this is just um, something that you put in to help Java check your code. It's a declaration that says, I'm overriding a method. And then when Java compiles the code, remember that first step before we execute it, it will look to see if it can find a function in one of my ancestors with the same name and the same signature. If it can't, I get this error that I saw before. Right? This is like a sanity check. Great question. Other questions about this? So slightly longer than, yeah, we're not gonna, you may see those on the MP, but we're not gonna use them in class. Okay, let's keep going. Uh, we talked about this. Right, ah, okay. Um, so now, okay, and, and, and again, um, so, so now things are gonna get more interesting. Right? So I told you that in Java, an instance of an object could morph and it could behave like other types of objects. And what we did is we just used that when we passed arguments to a function, but now we're gonna do it explicitly, okay? So actually, let me, um, let's look at what this code is doing. So this is, this is new, okay? And again, I'm not gonna, we're not gonna race through this, just slow down and look at it carefully. So on line nine, I create an instance of the dog class. Remember, look to the right of new. This is the type. And then I save that in a variable called ChuChu that saves an instance of a dog, right? Now, this is something that we haven't seen before. On line 10, I'm now creating a new variable called ChuChu as object, and I'm saving, now this is not a copy, we'll talk about exactly how this works in about a week or so, but essentially now I have another reference to ChuChu, but this one is as an object. So now ChuChu has morphed into an object, and I have a variable called ChuChu as object that refers to ChuChu as an object. He wouldn't like that, just like to be objectified. Um, down here on line 12, I'm doing the same thing with a, a pet class, okay? And then I'm gonna call printlin on both of those, which is gonna call toString. What you see happening is that no matter how I refer to ChuChu, if I refer to him as an object, if I refer to him as a pet, Java always knows that he's a dog. He was created as a dog, that's what's to the right of new on line nine. So no matter how I refer to him, I refer to him as an object on line 10 and on line 11, I refer to him as a pet on line 12 and line 13, Java still knows that he's a dog, okay? And I still get the right two string method. Okay, now, so this is, this, this is known as what's called upcasting. And this is sort of like casting. Remember we talked before about how I can cast different types of numbers to each other? I can cast different types of objects to each other. So here what I'm doing is I'm casting 
Chuchu, which is a dog, to an object. And I can do that because object is one of the parents of dog. I can also cast Chuchu to a pet, because again, pet is one of the parents of dog. So when I do an upcast, when I cast an object to one of its ancestors, Java will do this automatically for me. If I want to go the other direction, now things get more tricky. Right? So now let's, um, let's look at this piece of code. Right? The rabbit hole is getting deeper. On line nine, what type of object is, am I creating? What's to the right of new? Dog. What type of, ob what type of variable is this? Object. So again, this is new. We haven't seen this before. So here what I'm doing is I'm doing an upcast immediately. I'm creating an instance of dog, but I'm saving it into a variable of type object. And I can do that because it's an upcast. I'm casting dog to one of its ancestors. Dog extends pet, which implicitly extends object. So this is fine. And I can call print anything on that because it's an object. And print anything will, will take uh, we'll take any objects. Print anything isn't shown on this slide, but it's the same one we were using before. Now, if you look at what's happening on line 11, right? So now this is different than what we've seen before. So now what I'm doing is I'm taking choo-choo. Choo-choo, the choo-choo variable stores an object. And I'm, this is called a downcast. I'm casting it to one of its descendants. Pet inherits from object. Pet is one of object's children. So this, to do this, requires an explicit cast. Remember when we cast doubles to integers, we had to put the type inside parentheses? This is very similar. So now what I'm doing is I'm creating a variable called choo-choo as pet, of type pet, and I'm storing choo-choo as a pet. Choo-choo, I was referring to choo-choo as an object before, now I'm referring to choo-choo as a pet. And this works because Choo Choo is actually a dog. So I can always downcast, um, if, I have a, if I have a variable that's been upcast, and I can always downcast back to where I started. So I started with the dog class, which extends pet, which extends object. I did an upcast to object, which was okay because it's one of the ancestors. And now I'm doing an explicit downcast to pet, which is also okay because this object is a dog. I could also do an explicit downcast to dog, okay? So again, this will work okay. So I'm actually doing both of them here. I'm doing both the pet and all the way back to dog. Why do I need to do this? Well, let me show you something. What about, what about if I did this? Okay, so what's gonna happen now? Don't run the code, just think about it. Walk it through. Line nine, what kind of object am I creating? What's to the right of new? String. What kind of variable am I saving it into? Object. So this variable can hold any kind of object. It could hold a string, it could hold a dog, it could hold a pet. Now, now what happens here so now I'm trying to take a string and downcast it to a pet. Is this going to work? Let's find out. Yeah, so now I have an error. The reason is, when I do a downcast, I can't downcast to a type that the object isn't, isn't related to. So here, string inherits from object. So I can upcast string to object. But a string's not a pet, and it's not a dog. So I can't cast it down to a pet, or I can't, or to a dog. I can, if I wanted to, comment this out. I can cast it down to a string. I'll print it again, just to prove that it works. 
That works fine. So again, these explicit downcasts are unsafe. That's why Java makes me do this this way. If I try to do this, then I'm going to get this error message. The compiler is telling me what you have is an object. And you're trying to downcast it to a string, but in, I'm not going to do that because it could cause an error if this object isn't actually related to string. So I'm going to force you to put this explicit cast in here. Now you're taking responsibility for the situation. If it turns out that object is not a string, like let's say, let's make this a dog again, now I get a different variation of that same error. Okay, I'm sure your brains are all fried at this point. Well, well, you guys will get more practice with this. This is tough. I'm not going to lie, right? Learning how to think about these relationships, visualize, you know, the, the, the link, the, the inheritance relationship between pet and dog and object and think about kind of which ways they're going and stuff like that. This is, this is hard. Let me just finish up with this and then we'll do a problem. Promise. Okay. So you might wonder, if, this, if it's not safe to do this, how do I make sure that it is safe? If you give me an object, how can I tell? But let's say that I know that object is actually not an object. It's morphing into an object. It's actually some other type of object. How can I tell what it is? So there's an operator in Java called instance of. This is like a built-in operator. It's a reserved word. So what this does is it will tell me if a particular object is an instance of some other class, okay? So we can look at how this works. So what am I doing here? I have a pet class. I have two children that I've created of pet, dog, and cat. Both dog and cat extend pet. So pet is both the parent of dog and the parent of cat. Here what I'm doing is I've created two pets. One's a dog and one's a cat. But I'm upcasting them and I'm saving them as pet variables. So remember, what type of object is Choo Choo? Choo Choo's a dog. That's what's to the right of new. What's the type of the variable that I'm storing Choo Choo in right now? It's pet. And I can do that because Choo Choo can automatically, a dog can automatically morph into a pet. But if I want to take my pet, the, my variable that can store a pet, and make it act like a dog or like a cat, I need to figure out whether it's a dog or a cat. And so here what I'm doing is I'm testing to see is it a dog or a cat. This is Choo Choo. Choo Choo is a dog, true. Choo Choo is also a pet, true. Is Choo Choo a cat? False. Typically, let me, let me, ju let me just sort of uh, Let's just do a little example here that will hope, hopefully help drive this home. So let's, um, let's create a method that dogs have, and then we'll create a method that cats have. All right. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a method on the pet class. I'm going to call this, I think I'm actually doing one of the homework problems for you guys, but that's okay. And speak is going to take, yeah, let's just, let's just let it be run on an instance of pet. So now I've got two different types of pet. What I want this method to do is if this instance of pet is a dog, I want it to, to, I want it to call bark. If it's a cat, I want it to call meow. So I'm going to use this. I'll call bark. Oh, sorry. I need to say dog. I'll explain this in a second. And then, and I do need semicolons. It's Java, Jeff. All right, cool. Let's get rid of this stuff. Now let's call chuchu.speak. All right. Now let me, let me finish this example. Let's 
try to Okay. I think we'll probably spend the rest of the class here because this is this this gets interesting. Okay. So what did I just do there? First thing I did is I defined a method on dog and a method on cat. Okay? And this is important because not every pet has a method called bark. Only dogs can bark. Not every pet has a method called meow. Only pets that are cats can meow. Okay? If I have something that's just a pet, it can't meow or bark. But if my pet was actually a dog or a cat, then it has these functions. Okay? But which one I use, I have to determine based on what kind of pet it actually is. Now, I've defined in my pet class an instance method called speak. This can be called on any pet. But I want it to behave differently if the pet is a dog or a cat. If the pet is a cat, I want it to call meow. If the pet is a dog, I want it to call bark. But remember, this in this method is a pet. This method is being defined on the pet class. So inside this method, this refers to a pet. So what am I doing in my function? So I'm using this instance of operator. So this is going to be true if the instance that this is being called on is actually a dog or anything that descends from dog. So if it's a dog, I'm going to call bark. If it's a cat, I'm going to call meow. The last little bit I need to do here, unfortunately Java doesn't do this for you, is that I need to create a new dog variable. And I'm, now what I'm doing is I'm downcasting myself to be a dog. So I'm saying, OK, now I know that I'm a dog. So I'm going to refer to myself like a dog on line four. At that point, I can call me.bark. Okay. If I don't do that, let's look at what happens. Let's take this out of here, this line. Let's just call this dot bark. Now I get a compiler error, because Java is telling me I can't find bark. Why can't it find bark? Because not every pet can bark. Only dogs can bark. So before I can call bark, I need something that's actually a dog. OK. Got 10 minutes. Hit me with some questions here. This is, this, it, this, is, this is like kind of the pinnacle of what I want you to understand about polymorphism. You will see questions like this on a quiz, not this week, next week. Um, but this is kind of it, right? This is, if you can understand this, this is sort of like the mountaintop. So let's, let's talk about it. Yeah. Yeah, so, so the question is, why not just add a speak method to my dog class and my cat class. You could do that. Yeah, for, for the sake of example. There are times when you want this type of behavior, right? Because you want this, the, the parent class to handle something like this, right? Um, but I could, also, I could also define a speak class on dog and a speak class on cat. And those could do the right thing, yeah. That's a good point. Other questions? Yeah. The object that, that speak is being called on. Yeah. So great. So the great question. So, so the question is, what is this instance of looking at? Let me pull this all the way down. Yeah, I'm just not going to be able to get this all on the screen. So the first time I call speak, this refers to the variable choo-choo. Right? Choo-choo is a pet. But remember, choo-choo is storing an instance of dog. Right? When I call speak on line 27, this refers to ziz. Ziz is also a pet, but it's storing an instance of cat. Yeah. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah, this is not, look, this is not, uh, not easy stuff. This is sort of my, when we start looking at this polymorphism stuff, I think the, really the only thing that we can do is kind of put up something like this and puzzle through it together, right? It takes some time to develop some intuition for how these things work. Um, 
I have to say, though, this is actually, you know, again, this is one of those places where, you know, going back to frustration, some of you are going to feel that way. It doesn't like, it's like, oh, I'm not programming. I'm just like thinking about stuff, right? You know, that's not programming. I just want to like, I want to bang out some code, right? What's, so, but, but using type systems effectively turns out to be very, very powerful, right? Uh, and this is something that particularly when you guys move on and are working in more sophisticated languages that have, uh, you know, nice type systems. This really helps, right? Getting an understanding of not just types, but also kind of like the deeper reality that these categories are designed to express. Okay, other questions about this? Let's see, let's do some, okay, let's do something different. What about if I do this? Um, What's going to happen now? Make a prediction. Well, that's a walk me through. Yeah. Ah, okay. So, so I have a vote for it. Won't compile because it can't find speak. Anybody else want to want to? put up a different hypothesis? Yeah. Should do nothing? It's going to run, but it's not going to print anything? What else? Let's try it. Looks the same. Okay. Let's put a, a print line down here at the end just so we can make sure that we can see where the end is. Okay, so it just, it, it looks like it, it had no effect, right? And so now let's go back and look at our speak method again. So I handle the case where, the, where I'm a pet, sorry, I handle the case where I'm a dog, and I handle the case where I'm a cat. But that's it. This pet down here that I called it on Lulu is neither a dog nor a cat. And so it doesn't I don't hit any of the branches in my if statement. If I wanted to, let's add an else statement here, and I'll say, we'll say, pet specific noise. Okay, so now, when I call speak on Lulu, something's happening, right? Because Lulu's not a cat, it's not a dog, and so I end up and I'm sorry that this is so long, I end up down at the last branch of my if statement. Questions about this? All right. Me, I'll just to say a few more things today. Um, so this is, um, I just want to give you, and we don't have a huge number of chances in this class to talk about theory, which is fine. Go on, take 173 and 225, and you guys will hear more about uh, certain things. But um, what you're looking at is actually um, the, a certain theory about programming language design operating in practice. And this is called something called substitutability. Don't expect you guys to understand this definition. Um, you can read this, though, in a way that allows it to make sense, right? So essentially it says, if S is a subtype of T, that means if S extends T, then I can replace T with S without altering any of the desirable properties of T. Right? So essentially, let's try to read this in a certain way. If S is a subtype of T, right? let's say that um, T is object, so if S is anything, then objects of type T may replace an object of type S without altering any of the desirable properties of T. So essentially, something that has two string in Java can be replaced by any other object because they all have two string. Right? They might have their own version of it, but I can still call two string on that object. Okay? Right? So since everything in Java is an object, I always know that I can call these certain methods on anything. And this turns out to, again, be very, very important when we start looking at how to build general purpose data structures in the third half of the class. All right.
Um, so this type of, this is one type of polymorphism, right? This is referred to as subtype polymorphism. But we've seen this behavior before, right? Some of you may remember method overriding. So this is another type of polymorphism, right? In the sense that I have two functions that share the same name that can behave differently, right? In this case, the context that allows them to behave differently is actually the arguments that are being passed. So we've actually already seen polymorphism before. We just didn't call it that. We're also gonna see polymorphism again at the very end of the semester when we talk a little bit about generics. Um, right, which we'll talk about toward the end of class. Um, well, where, did, where did Barbara Liskoff go? I just wanted to point that out. Yeah, so the, the, the substitutability principle is, did she not make the slides? Oh, that's too bad, okay. So the substitutability principle is uh, called the Liskoff substitution principle. This is named after Barbara Liskoff, who's a famous living computer scientist, professor at MIT, winning a winner of the Turing Award, which is the highest award in computer science. All right, so that's where we're gonna wrap up today. I didn't get to the examples. If you guys want to see um, two worked examples, or I think at least one, I think we did last 10, um, I would encourage you to watch the video from last semester. We spent a little more time than usual today talking about wrapping up polymorphism. I think that's okay. I think that was good. Um, all right, please start MP2. MP2 is a little shorter than MP1 because it's due a few days before spring break. Um, if you haven't, for the orange team, good luck wrapping up MP1. We'll get you guys off to a good start on MP2 in lab tomorrow. I will see everybody on Wednesday. Good luck on the quiz.